the sea is where all life begins. Millions of creatures struggling for existence form a complex web where survival is the driving force. Lord over all since the dawn of time are the awesome ocean giants. In search of these creatures that rule the sea, Ben Krupp finds that special place where ocean giants meet. For the myriad creatures in the sea, life is often a constant struggle between predators and prey, and only the fittest survive. In this complex environment, the death of one means life for another. Ben Krupp and his crew are in Albany, Western Australia. The whaling station here is closing down and the last season is ending. Ben has come to this part of the coast in search of ocean giants. With author and journalist Hugh Edwards, Ben has the chance to film the magnificent savagery of the great white shark. The sharks have followed the whales in from the killing grounds, drawn irresistibly by the taste of blood and death. Frustrated by the whale's thick blubber, they tear at it ferociously to get at the red meat underneath. A cage is essential to Ben's survival. There's a lot of blood in the water, and the great white is the most dangerous shark in the world. These awesome creatures have existed essentially unchanged for over 60 million years. Their finely tuned senses are brilliantly adapted to their predatory way of life. They're amazingly sensitive. A shark can detect one part of human blood in 10 million parts of water. With their voracious appetite, they will eat almost anything. Empty bottles and cans and even kegs of nails have been found in their stomachs. In blood-crazed excitement, the sharks have been known to attack small boats or anything else in their path. Battered by the threshing monsters, even the cage is becoming unsafe. Very little is known of the Great White's behaviour. Divers like Ben and Hugh are adding to this scant knowledge all the time. One thing we can be certain about, the Great White is dangerous to man. Hugh knows that in this area frequented by holiday makers, the great white is a menace. As voracious as they are, the sharks are surprisingly calculated in their decision to feed. Hugh must camouflage the hook deep inside the bait. The drums attached to the lines will tire the shark after it strikes, making it an easy catch tonight. Oh, that's a big one. 
Yeah, that's the biggest one that we've caught so far. That's uh, 17 feet, that one, and it probably weighed somewhere between three and a half thousand pounds and four thousand. That's almost two tons. That's a big fish. It's uh, contracted a bit, but it's got quite a bite. We can very easily put it over here. Whoa, he bite me in half. And if we're very careful about it, we can actually put it over both of us. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite a bite. That is big teeth. But there must mm. be uh, bigger ones than this down there. They've had bites on the sharks at Albany. They indicate they've probably got sharks down there over 20 feet, perhaps as much as 24 or 25 mm. feet. How much bigger than this? Twice as big? Uh, at least twice as big. Albany is the site of Australia's oldest industry, whaling. Before the West Coast was settled, the area was visited by British, French and American whaling ships. Many of the early convict ships were also whalers, and after unloading their human cargo, they would go off hunting. In 1845, there were about 300 whalers operating off the rugged south coast. The discovery of petroleum sent the industry into rapid decline. But in 1952, the Chains Beach Company were able to successfully revive whaling near Albany. In the peak year of 1956, over a thousand humpback whales were taken off the west coast. But the 1963 season was a disaster. Given an allocation of 550 by the International Whaling Commission, the hunters could only capture 87. The whalers have hunted these magnificent giants almost to the point of extinction. There are so few left, their killing is no longer economic. And the humpback is now totally protected. But sperm whales were thought to be more plentiful off the Albany coast, so the killing of whales continued. The romantic image of man pitting his wits against the leviathan of the deep has long gone. With today's fast ships, sonar tracking and explosive head harpoons, the whales don't have a chance. Under pressure from conservation groups and public outcry, all but two whaling countries have pulled out of this sickening slaughter. A few days after this film was taken, the Chains Beach Company closed down. In early 1979, the Australian government at last banned all whaling in this country. For the great whites scavenging in the bay, this will be the last easy feed of whale meat. This is the uh, shark we caught last night. He's about 15 feet and um, on the scales down there he weighed uh, just under 2,000 pounds. Yeah, he's frozen solid now, he's been in the freezer all night. And we take him up to Perth on the trailer and what we do is we um, wrap him up in hessian, hose him down and put him back in the snap and that cocoons him like a, an Egyptian mummy in ice and hessian and he lasts about uh, seven or eight hours of the trip. Mm. It's about just under 300 miles. Well, just there you go, it's a glass we'll see again for a while. This is a, a giant squid, it's a large one of the specimens which the whales feed. And this was in, in the was in whale's stomach? That was in a whale's stomach. The squid has ten tentacles. Most of them are about, on this one, are about six feet long, as you can see. These are long ones. These are bitten off when the whale swallowed them. And these ones here go out uh, two thirds usually the length of the body. Uh, we've got a slightly smaller one than this. Um, that's actually probably about half the weight. Mm. But uh, that's 24 feet long with, it, with its things. And this one here, with its long trailing 
Um, sort of being close to 40 feet long. I wouldn't want to meet one of these fellows underwater, would you? Okay. Usually found in myths and legends, the giant squid really exists. A 40-foot monster swallowed like Jonah by a great sperm whale. Hugh will join Ben later at Shark Bay. Now he's off to the Royal Perth show to exhibit his strange cargo. Ben's regular crew, divers Ron Bell and Wally Gibbons, prepare the beaver for the long voyage ahead. The plan is to head north and follow the path of the migratory whales. Reprieved and free now to roam the coast, Ben believes the whales will move north to Shark Bay. Normally living in the Antarctic, the humpbacks must carve in warmer waters as their young are not well protected from the cold. Ben noses beaver towards them carefully. Their memories of ships and men can't be very fond. Diver Lynn Patterson shows more than a passing interest in these cliffs. In 1712, the Dutch treasure ship Zeitdorp spilled a quarter of a million silver coins right under that cliff face. There are two main families of whales. The baleens live in cold water and feed on plankton and small shrimps. They strain their food from the water through sieve-like plates in their mouths. The other family is the toothed whale, and they prefer warmer waters and feed on deep ocean creatures like squid. Sperm whales belong to the toothed family, and the humpbacks that Ben has found are baleens. The whale's streamlined and flexible bodies promote the smoothest of movement through the water by constantly changing their shape to conform their body contours to the lines of water flow, they are able to move at speeds not matched by beaver's hull. Only their repeated dives allow Ben to keep a steady pace with them. The whales are getting used to beaver. They're so close their huge pectoral fins are almost touching the boat. The fins provide the power for deep dives. The Air Force surveillance plane is checking out the strange flotilla as beaver runs with the ocean giants. Lynn prepares to record the explosive sounds from their twin blowholes. An added bonus is the rainbow arching from the bursts of spray. Whales are highly intelligent and sensitive creatures. They have a larger brain than any beast that has lived on Earth, including man. The more we learn of these wonderful creatures, the more it seems senseless to destroy them. The whales have brought Ben to Cape Inscription, which marks the entrance to Shark Bay. As if to welcome him to the bay, a rare whale shark crosses beaver's path. These huge, harmless sharks also feed on the microscopic plankton that drifts in profusion on the surface. I hope he stays around. Then can you hand me the camera when I get down, please? Reaching to 15 metres in length, the whale shark belongs to the same family as the white shark, but formidable as they may look, they're very gentle and not carnivorous.
Whale sharks are easily recognisable by the white spots which cover their brownish backs. The head is broad and quite flat, and their huge mouths extend the full width. Like a giant vacuum cleaner, they suck the plankton in from up to two metres away. You need to be careful with these giants, even though they are docile. Their coarse hide can take the skin off a diver easily, and a swipe from their powerful tail can be devastating. Hey, Lynn. How was it? Oh, beautiful. Really terrific creature. What a feeding machine. Well, that's good. <laughs> Oh, you should see that mouth working. Just really beautiful. Well, we can see it from up here. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> Cape Inscription is so named because it was here in 1616 that the Dutchman Dirk Hartog became the first European to set foot in Western Australia. To commemorate the historic event, Hartog inscribed a pewter plate with his name, his ship and the date and nailed it to a pole on the Cape. Fifty years later, another Dutchman, Willem de Vlaming, was sent to the area to search for a missing treasure ship. He too landed at the Cape, and after replacing Hartog's plate with a new one, he took the original for display in a museum. Many Dutch ships landed on the west coast, but most found it an inhospitable place. Here in particular, it's barren and windswept. The Vlamings log shows that when he left here, Five cannons were fired to signal farewell to, as he called it, the miserable Southland. With a storm coming up, the area is becoming miserable for Ben's team too. The seas are rising, so Ben runs for cover deep into Shark Bay and longitude 112.5 degrees east. The cyclone was moving in a southerly direction at 27 kilometers per hour closer to the coast. For people in the northern area from Mr. McNamara. The violent storm has wreaked havoc in Shark Bay. But not only man has suffered. The beaches are littered with the flotsam and jetsam of nature, too. A school of rare melon-headed whales are among those that didn't survive. As in all of nature, life is constantly being renewed in the sea. Much of it begins here, in the shallow bays and inlets, estuaries and swamps of Shark Bay. In these areas where land and sea merge, plant materials, minerals and other nutrients washed from the land encourage lush sea grasses, algae and plants. The mangrove swamps provide essential food for thousands of species of aquatic and marine life. Tidal shallows and mud flats are a haven and feeding ground for birds and a rich environment for all kinds of small animals like worms, mollusks and crabs. A delicate cycle of life is maintained in this complex and amazingly productive ecosystem. For some, it's a constant struggle. 
Smaller ones are preyed upon by larger ones, and they in turn fall prey. Some, like the mud crab, spend their entire lives here fighting for survival against even their own species. The crab will regenerate its lost claw, whilst the old one becomes food for the spectators. Abundant food and good protection provide a nursery for young fish. Some are born far out to sea and then seek the refuge of these coastal shallows. Here they will mature before returning to brave the open ocean. But casualties are high even here. There are many predators and they too are aware of the abundance of life in the shallows. So many species ensure the survival of their kind by providing safety in numbers. The common mullet, for example, found all around the Australian coast, can lay a million eggs in one season. In the spawning season, the fish come together in huge schools, and this is always a good time for fishing. Streaker, the ship's cat, has been very patient with Scruffy. And now the reward. This one was worth waiting for. Shark Bay was so named by the English buccaneer William Dampier because of the large number of sharks he saw here. In this vast breeding ground, food is plentiful for all predators. The leopard shark is one of the less aggressive members of its species. It feeds on small creatures like octopus and shellfish. At a certain time of the year, they migrate south from the tropics to places like this for mating. plays host to another migratory shark in the breeding season. Grey nurse sharks travel north in the winter and congregate in deep gutters for their mating activities. <laughs> Diving into a pack of sharks at night seems like a foolhardy venture. Ben wants to observe a strange aspect of the grey nurse's behaviour. Unlike fish, sharks don't possess an air bladder. They must swim continuously or sink. But the grey nurse seems to be an exception. Ben has watched them hover mid-water in the daytime just like fish. He believes they can generate gases inside their stomachs to adjust their buoyancy. Tonight though, they don't seem to feel like resting. Perhaps the lamp and the closeness of the divers is keeping them on the move. The Shark Bay area is a fascinating study in the never-ending cycle of food chains and webs. Energy from the sun promotes the growth of plankton, algae and plants in the shallows. Young fish either born here or coming in from the open sea feed on the rich food source. The small fish, in turn, are eaten by the larger fish, or birds. It's a complex and delicate system, and without it, countless species of marine and bird life couldn't exist. 
the cycle will continue indefinitely, unless upset by natural catastrophe or the plans of humans. On Ben's long voyage, he's often found the endless cycle of life extraordinary in its tenacity. Even though Beaver has been constantly on the move, her hull must be cleaned regularly to remove the tiny creatures that cling doggedly on. Around the reefs at the entrance to the bay, and in the deeper water beyond, another part of the drama unfolds. Young fish grown to maturity in the shelter of the shallows are now ready to brave the open sea. But many types of fish spend their whole lives at sea, migrating in huge schools from one feeding ground to the next. These are pelagic fish, and they generally inhabit the waters around the continental shelf, sometimes coming closer inshore for feeding. Breeding grounds like Shark Bay are a bonanza for these voracious fish. Competition is tough. As in the shallows, survival depends on it. Drawn by the erratic movement of dead and dying fish, the professionals now move in and take over the hunt. As the frenzied feeding screams to fever pitch, anything in the way can find itself part of the food chain, even Ben and Wally. But then sharks aren't always king. Shark Bay has been the scene of other battles. In 1941, the HMAS Sydney fought an engagement with the German raider Cormoran a few kilometres offshore. Both ships sank. The Sydney went down with all hands. But 317 survivors from the Cormoran were picked up here in the bay. This was one of their lifeboats. The ships that come here now are quieter in their purpose. The only large industry in Shark Bay is the salt works at Useless Loop. The joint Japanese-Australian venture incorporates both production and loading facilities. The natural evaporation technique is used with large-scale brine ponds that cover many square kilometres. The salt is hard on machinery, and cars and trucks don't last long at all. This one is only 18 months old. Ben moves off again, in search of more ocean giants. In the South Passage entrance, Ben spots a commotion in the water and changes course to investigate. It's a large and very rare leathery turtle. Ben was surprised by the turtle's wild threshing and thought it might be sick or just plain crazy. But then the reason became more apparent. The turtle's behaviour is an evasive tactic. The great white waits patiently for the animal to tire itself out. Ben decides to give the unfortunate turtle a hand and moves beaver in between the shark and its prey. 
The shark has been frightened off, but still the turtle thrashes away. It apparently regards beaver as a new threat. The leathery is the largest of all marine turtles. It's a migratory animal and the nearest known rookery is in Malaysia. So this fellow has come quite a long way. Trust him at all. Mm. He's a bit cranky. Yeah, he's cranky, all right. I don't think he liked this thing out in that turtle's meal. <laughs> there he is. Big one, about four meters. I'm glad I wasn't down there. Did he come right up to you? About three, three feet away, I suppose. A school of bottlenose dolphins ride Beaver's bow, leading Ben into the lagoon at Monkey Mere. As Ben anchors Beaver, the dolphins swim right into the shallows. To Ben's astonishment, the local fishermen are totally unconcerned and go about their work. Apparently, this happens nearly every day at Monkey Mia. Throughout history, there have been tales of dolphins who were friendly to humans. In New Zealand this century, two dolphins named Polaris Jack and Opo delighted thousands of people for years. On this beach, another legend is in the making. It seems that dolphins like humans, but only just tolerate dogs. Scruffy can't take the hint. Ben knows that it usually takes a lot of patience and careful training before dolphins in captivity will trust humans. But here, in the wild, the dolphins have chosen to come and make friends entirely of their own accord. Wolf and Hazel Mason live in Monkey Mia. Well, it all started uh, quite a few years back. Um, we believe it started by a, a young girl throwing fish to the dolphins out on the jetty. And uh, eventually she got it that uh, the dolphin was coming down onto the, the beach and then she started to feed it off the beach. But this was quite a few years ago. We have heard of old Charlie. Charlie was a legend in his own right. Apparently he used to uh, round up the bait for the fishermen and uh, he was very tame. He'd come right in onto the beach and you'd have no trouble patting Charlie or taking photos of the children sitting on him, this type of thing. And eventually we had, uh, how many all together? About 11, 11 at one stage. Year and three babies. And, uh, you know, this type of thing has grown and grown. This year, there are not so many. Uh, I think they might be out mating or they've got problems of their own, I suppose, to worry about. But um, now, here, at the particular time now, we've got about six coming in regularly. Just to give you an idea how tame they get, the children reported that there was one dolphin with a hook in the side of its mouth. And when I went down, there was a big snapper hook jammed in the side of its mouth with a trace down about so long. We felt we had to do something with it, so... Uh, we called it right in and this particular one would come right in on the sand. She was very tame and she came right in and we uh, I went down and I thought I might be able to cut up the hook and just let it rust out. But uh, 
So I took the pliers down and when we got her in I thought, well, I'll try and get it out with the pliers if I can. So I concentrated on it, got her right in and I caught hold of it with the pliers and it must have taken me about 10 or 15 seconds to get that hook out. And all that time she just, just lay there. She never even moved, never shook her head, never wriggled. She just lay there and eventually after 10 or 15 seconds I, I got it out and she shook her head and took a couple of fish and that was it. She moved off again. And I maintain that she knew, the moment that I took hold of that hook, she knew that I was going to get that hook out for her. That shows you just how intelligent they are. They're just like human beings. Very gentle. Didn't even knock my lip. <laughs> Notice how he sort of turns sideways yeah. so he doesn't hurt you. Well, that's the same as the time the uh, one came in with um, crying. That's right. The sound was totally different, the noise that they make. And they were definitely, she was definitely crying. And she came in, we tried to feed her. Uh, she couldn't hold the fish in her, her mouth. We tried several ways. And uh, it, it just wouldn't swallow or anything. And later on, we found it down the beach, or I suppose about three weeks later, and it was dead. The dolphins trust humans so much, they even bring their babies in to show them off. Ben has instigated government protection for this incredible family of wild dolphins. Their wish to meet us must be considered a privilege. The usually rare dugong seems to abound in Shark Bay. Evidently, there are about a thousand of them here, making it the largest known reservoir in Australia. This endangered species is now protected, and their hunting for food is restricted entirely to Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. Fisheries inspector Derek Blackman has agreed to help Ben study and film their movements. We just came from over here, Derek, over in these flats, and we found a lot of dugong, quite a, quite a herd, and they all seem to be sort of travelling down this way south, but I wasn't too sure, you know, whether they're, they're heading down this way or, or down this. Do you, do you know? Well, Ben, this time of the year, what seems to happen, the dugong move from down in the Fresnay estuary mm -hmm. and gradually move their way north, and they come from down here around the islands, around Borden Island, Wilds Island, Double Island, and they move and gradually come up, and they seem to congregate around about Bar Flats. Yeah. And then they come from here, and they break up, and some come down the inner bar, mm -hmm. through here, and round to Surf Point, and South into Passage. South Passage. Uh -huh. And I'd say, if you were to go over to South Passage, yeah. now, it's quite on the cards that you'd come across a school of Dugan, or um, a mm -hmm. big herd of them, or something like that. I was across at South Passage last week, Ben, and did I... Did you see many? Yeah, I did, as a matter of fact. There's, um, there was a herd of about 68 mm -hmm. we counted, and they were right on that surf point, right on this, yeah. right on this point here, right, right on the tip of the reef. It comes across and oh, just at the end of Dirk Hardock Island. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great because just out here, that's where we ran into the whales, and the water's pretty clear coming in there. So I presume just over this reef, it should be nice and clear to film there. It was. It was very, very clear. Mm. Visibility was perfect. Ben is excited at the prospect of so many dugong, and the clear water. To his knowledge, they've never been filmed underwater before because they usually inhabit murky waters. The dugong feeds on the short sea grasses found in shallow protected areas around the coast. The animal is of great interest to scientists and naturalists as it's the only existing species of herbivorous or plant-eating mammal that lives exclusively in the sea. Shark Bay is a complex system of shallow inlets and passages with strange names like Useless Loop and Hopeless Reach. Ben followed the moving herd through this labyrinth and into the South Passage entrance. Ben has found where the dugong meet. It's opposite Steep Point, 
in the sheltered waters behind the reef. The crew decide not to use scuba, as the bubbles may scare the shy creatures away. Ben keeps low, hiding among the weeds, so that he can get the camera in as close as possible. Like cows in a paddock, the dugong graze quietly on their favorite sea grasses. For some reason, the dugong aren't as shy as Ben expected. After backing off initially, the dugong return in a wide arc to take an inquisitive look at the funny-looking newcomers. It's hard to imagine that these rather ugly creatures inspired the legends of mermaids so revered by medieval sailors. Even so, scientists have named the species Cyrenians. But their interest soon wanes, and the dugong move off in search of more peaceful pastures. Ben doesn't mind, though. He's already been luckier than he expected. The reef turns out to be a bonanza for the whole crew. Every rock ledge is teeming with delicious crayfish. The added bonus of a feast is a nice cap to an already successful day. Come on. Okay. Come on. Steep Point, near the Dugong feeding grounds, has only one major claim to fame. It's the most westerly tip on the Australian mainland. It's a windswept spot and it's continually lashed by big Indian Ocean swells. Ben and his crew are here on a pilgrimage. For those hardy few who have travelled all the way from the east to the west of Australia, a grand tradition has grown up. At the end of the point are dozens of rock cairns, built by weary travellers to commemorate the end of their long journeys. Ben, Lynn, Ron and Wally have voyaged for nearly two years to get here from the east coast and Beaver's log shows they've covered over 10,000 nautical miles. The cairns make interesting reading. Some have crossed the country on foot, others on bikes or four-wheel drives and one girl crossed alone on a camel. The crew feel they've earned the right to add their names to the list. For the remainder of Ben's stay in the area, he visits the dugong feeding grounds every day. On his many trips, Ben often comes across other ocean giants. The giant manta ray, like the whale shark, is a harmless plankton feeder.
realizing that he means them no harm. The dugong are now allowing Ben to get closer and closer. A number of cows have begun to appear with very young calves. They're probably only a few months old. The female gives birth to only one calf a year, suckling it from tiny teats located under each foreflipper. At feeding time, the female holds the calf maternally with a flipper around its shoulder. But in between feeds, the calf will slide up and ride piggyback on top of its mother. Much research remains to be done on the dugong. But Ben found them intensely interesting and their delightful behavior unique. Ben never ceases to be amazed by the staggering richness of life in the sea. He and his crew have found the bountiful waters of Shark Bay to be a place of many wonders. In a cycle as old as time, life is constantly being renewed at the crossroads where ocean giants meet. <laughs>